Good evening to my sisters and brothers on the platform. We give God thanks for yet another opportunity to gather, to carry out um, one of God's commands. Ex one excuse of the things me. Excuse me, Sister Marcelin. I yes, ma'am. I think you forgot your hat or head tie. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. So this evening, God, God bless you all for bless us all for assembling. I will do that in um in a second, um, Sister Need. Um I just saw the time going. So God um truly bless us for being here this evening again and you know listening to the songs just now there um i'm reminding us about god's faithfulness and we truly say thanks to god for that um we know he's a forgiving god and he keeps loving us uh he raises our past our past and our debts are paid and washed away our sins and all of that, and truly, we thank God for that. And as the song rightly said, so many times we um, ask God to forgive us, and He does. And we go and we we continue to remind Him. We continue to remind Him. He has already forgiven us. He has washed it, washed away that that sin, and thrown yeah, what what the song says, thrown it in the sea of forgetfulness. But we keep reminding Him. We keep reminding Him. But this evening, let us continue to just trust him. Let us continue to trust him. As we usually say, we cannot, um, we are not trying to figure him out or anything, but we are just going to continue to trust him um, because he's truly faithful in all of his ways. And we thank him for his love, his grace, and his mercy. And um, we give God thanks this evening that we are here again. And we are way past six o'clock, so... At this time, we will just go right into um, into our study for this evening, and um, let me just. Uh, I hope I hope she can get 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 on very quickly. So Cecilia, just give us the opening prayer this evening, please. Thank you. If you can open up quickly, just a short opening prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we could study thy word. Yes. Have your way in our lives. And as we join together to study thy word, we pray, Father God, they will give us the wisdom to understand what is being taught to us, that we will be able to give it out to other people. Have your way in our lives and continue to bless us and be with our mother with her in a special way, Jesus. Have your way in her life and continue to be with her, walk with her closely, that she will be able to give us the things that's coming from you. Father God, have your way in our lives as we wait upon you for Christ's sake. Amen. Have your way, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Cecilia. So at this time, I'll throw it right over to uh, Sister Kershaw. Sister Kershaw, could you pick it up from there, please? I hope that you're home um, safe and sound and that it is well with you. So God bless you. Over to you. Pleasant evening, each and every one. Welcome back to another Bible study session. And we are grateful that God is a God that is who is merciful and that He doesn't keep score, unlike some of us sometimes. He doesn't keep score of every little evil thing that we do. He is more than merciful unto us, even though we take advantage of it sometimes. All right. Um so we're here to study and find out more about this God who, as we said in our last session, wants to have relationship with us, right? As I was, one of my ending remarks in the last session was, you know, a lot of times people say God is not your little friend. And contrary to that fact, he actually wants to be our friend, right? Um, and as I was kind of discovering over the past couple of weeks, you know, God, God don't make joke, but He's a real comedian. God has a fantastic sense of humor, right? Um, so before we jump in there, you know, in trying to bring a relationship with God, I guess that's one of the things we have to learn about God. 
right? He's serious, but he does make real jokes, right? Um, and there have been a couple of instances in, in personal life that I've seen that God, is, God could be a comedian when he's ready. Yeah, so um, grateful that God still decides to reveal himself to us, even when we mess up, like a lot. All right, so today we are still in Matthew chapter 5. Um, we started last year, probably last quarter last year, and we planning along with Matthew chapter 5. All right, so we'll be going from verses 27 to 30, and this is one of Jesus's, in my opinion, this is one of Jesus's harder teachings. All right, when you really sit down to like think about what he actually asking us to do in this um, part of the Sermon on the Mount, it is one of his harder sayings. This is not gentle Jesus speaking here. This is Jesus who is asking us to toughen up a little bit. All right. Um, and so just for context, what that passage of scripture says is that if a man um, so much as looks at a woman with lust, all right, he's already committed adultery. Right. And um, if we start to think about that, I mean, you haven't done anything. Right? You haven't committed the act. But Jesus is letting us know your very thoughts is what he is judging us on. So we have to be mindful of our thoughts. And then that passage continues to talk about, you know, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eyeball offends you, cut it off. And I mean, those are two really, you know, not just hard, but gruesome things to do to yourself. And well, I mean, it, it's doable. It, trust me, it, it doable, but it's hard because it's painful, right? You're gonna stop at some point, right? If 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 we have any people who used to still watch our movies, there's a movie called Saw, a series called Saw, and there are people who had to do those things. So it's not impossible, but it's difficult and it's torture. But Um, Jesus, so when I was reading the passage, um, obviously, obviously you have to think of, but did Jesus actually mean that? But out of all of it, what I came to realize is that Jesus just wants us to be disciplined. All right. He wants us to get to a kind of level of discipline that doesn't require us to reach that point all right um and so one of the questions that popped up when i was reading the passage was why was it that why is it that god demands discipline from us and i mean apart from this passage of scripture throughout the bible we could see that god demands a certain um, a certain level of behavior from us requires certain things from us and when you look at the entire Bible, you have to ask yourself, well, why does God want us to like do all these things? Why is he, why is he insisting that we do certain things? And so again, it comes back to, to just discipline. All right. Um, when we think of the military, all the most popular military factions is the United States military. Well, I mean, of course, we have the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, right? But um, when you think about like, like discipline, discipline, no slacking off, no, just like rigid, you kind of think of places like the US and you think of like China and you think of like North Korea and stuff like that. So when you think of the military, you know that they have their rules, guidelines, they have their um, curfews, they have their own essentially their own laws to themselves. When you decide that you want to join that particular regimen, literally from day one, they shape you into what it is they need you to be. So they do things like, they, well, for the men at the very least, they give them a buzz cut, they put them on like, um, they call them these kind of like uh, exercise programs, they run you through the rigors. It's really, really tough. Right? You can't leave when you want. Sometimes it's weeks and you see your family. Um, sometimes 
well, when when you do see a family, there's a particular procedure that you have to follow, right? Because if you ever watch those um like reunion videos, I think the way that it goes is that they you don't get to move to that in your parade or whatever and they show off and stuff, and you don't get to move until one of your family members come and touch you. That is, you can't move at all. All right. So all I have to say is that the military, when you think of those um, places, it's very strict, very stringent, and they have to follow all those rules. And the piece that I was reading, they were, say, they were saying, well, why is, is it do we think that the military has to be so, you know, rigid? And it's not because they want to brainwash you into being this protector of the country or whatever it is. It's not that they want to erase your life. But the point is that the goal, which is essentially to protect, just give me one second, because I'm hearing some noise. Oh, I knew I was hearing something. Right, there we go. That's better. Yeah. So, um, people are saying... You know, it's not that they want to erase your identity or try to take anything away from you. But the entire thing is, the goal, which is to keep the country safe, is more important than individual wants, needs, desire at that point in time. And in order for that goal to succeed, everybody has to be on the same page. All right? One person can't be doing what he wants and somebody else doing what they want and they expect whatever country it is to remain safe all right so that is why they have such strict rules and guidelines and different things that they would require so that you could be you know on point sharp so that you'll be able to protect what you're supposed to be protecting and luckily for us oftentimes we refer to ourselves christians that is we refer to ourselves as soldiers so we're supposed to be kind of picking up on that right we should understand what it is like kinda to be in an army if you're taking it from the literal sense um second timothy 2 3 and 4 talks about suffering hardship as a good soldier of christ right um and paul goes on an entire line talking about us being good soldiers and suffering and all of that right and as much as we second timothy chapter 2 verses 3 to 4 um and as much as we like to quote that passage of scripture, it is it is a lot more difficult to kind of like grasp. And, and it's not difficult to understand as much as it is to grasp. Because when you sit down and you think about what it really is going to take to be a servant of God, it's a lot. It's a lot. Right? Especially since the human being was already made to kind of like govern themselves they were born with that right everybody wants to be their own boss with god they can't really do that when you have one boss when you submit to god it's when you have one boss and quite literally there's not there isn't anything that you should be really trying to do on your own right so just like the the army has its own thing god has his own set of rules regulations if we intend to be under him and to be referred to or be considered children of God. And the thing about it is, much like the army, God don't force you to come to try to be one of his. Right? He gives you his space. He sends, he puts out the invite. He leaves it there. And then he lets you make your own decision. But once you make the decision to take up that invitation, you are required to do certain things. You are required to be disciplined per his guidelines, per his rules. Right? And as we keep saying by us, it's not about us. It's never about us. God is the only star of the show when it comes to this thing, right? I think sometimes we forget. We forget that God is the, the one who is ultimately in charge, all right? Um, so in being, dis in being disciplined, um, we are able to successfully complete the goal that is in front of us. And we all know, should know, that the goal or the aim of God is to rescue the world from this sinful state. Um, another thing that we get mixed up with a lot of time is 
we kind of like forget that God understands that this wasn't our fault. Right? But he's asking us to make a choice. And he is asking us also to help people understand that they have a choice to escape what was put upon them, essentially. Right? Um, and so for us, we have to kind of understand what discipline looks like. All right, well, this is just some of the suggestions that the, the, when I was Googling what they said, could be some of the disciplines that we could follow up with. Um, so things, simple things, praying, fasting, private worship, um, Bible study, meditation, all these are little disciplines that will help us um, get stronger, become closer to God, and other benefits which I will get to in a minute. Right? Um, any questions or comments so far? We could just flow ahead. Uh, it's just a question. Top of the afternoon to everybody on the platform. You all hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Right. Um, let's have a good evening to everyone on the platform. I trust that God will grant us the necessary understanding. Um, what I have discovered recently is like um, if we when we get into the word of God if we don't contextualize the subjects or the issues that we are dealing with we oftentimes fall prey to misinterpreting the context in which it was written or which is in which it was supposed to be interpreted. And reading this passage of scripture from 27, we will not be able to understand the context of 27 if we don't go to 32, from 27 to 32. So 31 and 32 will really um light light up the uh 27 which is what we're talking about um which we started to talk about so it's like when we get to 27 it says he have heard that it was said and jesus is speaking here this is jesus with his galilean ministry and speaking he is speaking here so this is not a second this is not a disciple speaking. This is Jesus speaking. So what he's saying, it is plain, nothing to be added, nothing to be taken away. You have heard that it is said by them of old, and he is quoting um, Moses' law, thou shall not commit adultery. Right. So the first thing we have to know, what is adultery? And I don't know if anybody... On the other side there could quickly um make a suggestion what they think adultery is any anybody what do you think adultery is i'm going somewhere with this anybody could anybody could say That's what they think relationship with a romantic relationship with someone that is not your spouse. All right. Um, right. So I thought that would have been a response. So according to the Bible interpretation of adultery, it is the breaking of a marital vow. That is adultery. What you described there is fornication. That is illicit intercourse. And illicit mean not allowed by law. So when we're taking this into context, we have to look at that that what you described there is what will bring about adultery for somebody to break the vow. So we have two things: illicit intercourse, which is fornication, and then we have adultery, which is the result of because when we look at we get into 31 and 32. Get into 31 and 32. 
that answers the question what Jesus is speaking about. So, 31 says, it has been said, and he's quoting Moses, the law of Moses here, whoever shall put away his wife, that means to divorce his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That is a bill of departure or a bill of, of a release saying, putting, putting them away. But, 32 says, but I say unto you, and Jesus here now is saying, Moses say, a bill of divorcement will be all right for you to put away your wife. But Jesus is saying here, and this is not, anybody's interpretation. This is what he's saying in 32. Jesus is saying, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife and that pause there, except, except. So there's a condition for that to happen. Except it, the word here says saving, but that word interpreted to be except for commit that except she commit adultery. So that is except she commit adultery. Saving for the cause of fornication, illicit intercourse. So if you find either of the spouse committing fornication, which would lead to adultery, the breaking of your marital vow, there is a condition, Jesus said, that is allowed, you are allowed to put her away. That cause, except for, except for fornication, you are allowed to put her away. Here, the next part that we are struggling with in this whole exercise and bringing a burden upon you when you yourself do it. Jesus said, you even watch on a woman. Now, if you watch a woman and lust after her, it means as a married person, you already break your marital vow. And what we find was happening in those days, a fellow would have his wife, and when he sees somebody else, this is why this condition is put down here. When he sees somebody else that he's interested in, it was easy to run to the law, get a bill of separation, and serve them with it. And Jesus is saying here by his word, if your wife or your husband commit fornication, you have the right to put them away. It goes further to say, you cause her. So if you cause that person when you put her away, except for fornication, so you have to leave out fornication there. Because if you leave, if you have fornication there, you have the legal right to put them, give them the, a, a divorce. And it has no attachment to it nowhere there where Jesus say you can't remarry or nothing like that there. The condition here now is if you put her away for anything outside of fornication, you will cause her to commit adultery, meaning to break her marital vow. And if anybody married her that is, and the word her, married her, because he was, he was talking about a particular instance there where a person is caught in a, um, a fornication, committing fornication, which is illicit, illicit intercourse, you could put her away. But if you didn't find her in that and you want to bring somebody else in the pity and give her a bill, you will cause her to commit adultery, meaning you will cause her to break a marital vow. She now cannot marry anybody because she was not caught in any act. You cause her by your action to commit adultery, which is breaking her marital vow. She is not supposed to remarry. So there's a condition there, and there's a saving clause here that Jesus is saying, except, and that would have to be properly scrutinized, except for fornication. So the way we look at what Jesus is saying here, it's not so hard. You don't bung to look on a woman. You could look on a woman and admire her for God's handiwork and her beauty. 
But when you lust after her, you already uh, has broken your marital vow because you want to be with her. So you that we understand that. So it's not hard. It's not difficult. It looked like it rigorous. It looked like if it's a yoke upon our neck, but it's very simple. Somebody is caught in the act of adultery, and you catch them um, having a, a outside relationship. You have the right to divorce them, and if you want, according to Jesus here, according to what the word is saying here, except for fornication, and there's nothing added to that except for fornication, causing her to commit adultery. So we have to get to understand that Jesus Christ, as difficult as the law is, he made provision, genuine provision, for if there is unfaithfulness in the relationship, you could save yourself from that. So the thought of a Christian cannot, under no condition, um, left their relationship and marry somebody else. Jesus is saying different here. I'll leave it there for now. If you have any question, you, I'll take them. Um, all right. Thank you, Brother Mike. Um, you kind of raised ahead, ahead, ahead of me there with our study because divorce is such a heavy and sad to say a not well handled topic in the church. Wonderful. That I decided to purposefully save that for another time. I, I am actively praying about how to handle it. So you kind of race ahead for me there, but you also set a platform <laughs> that we could go into. This week, I just kind of want to handle what is the, I'm saying easier, but easier in air quotes, part of what Jesus was trying to say. And even what we're talking about today is the groundwork for what comes later down. Um, because... I think, not I think, we need to stop as a church pretending that we are these saved, sanctified, holy, I mean we are supposed to. supposed to be, but we need to stop pretending that we are also not human beings and we, that we don't know what is what. I think for a lot of us, we know very well what a lustful thought is versus what a thought of admiration is. Jesus wasn't talking about a thought of admiration in this one at all. We know. We don't have to talk about it, but in the corners of our minds, we've had those thoughts. We've all had those thoughts. And I'm putting it out on the internet. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, all of us Christians, as much as we like to dress with skirts long to the ground, we've all had those thoughts, and sometimes we struggle with them. It is what it is, Right? Jesus wasn't talking about, in this passage, he wasn't talking about, you know, you see somebody nice and you go, oh, he's a beautiful person, or she's a beautiful person, or he's beautiful, or she's beautiful. He's talking about those thoughts that you can't really vocalize. He's talking about when your mind carries you to some places where you really ain't supposed to be, to the point where you feel sick. That is what he's talking about. All right? Um, and the divorce part of it is the stuff that, comes from from okay so jesus did it in an order so when he was talking in verse 27 there yes he was talking to my people because adultery is generally considered to be a part of when sorry um married people you know commit that act right or did they step out of their marriage but as you rightfully said, we have to take things into context. Jesus wasn't just talking about married people here. Jesus was also thinking that rule for single people who needed to guard their mind. If you can't be disciplined when you're single, how you expect to be disciplined when you're married? Jesus was trying to get that, that point across. He was doing things in sequence, right? So while he said adultery, and we know adultery is associated with marriage, what he really meant for everybody was you need to watch the way that you think about people, the way that you consider 
the way the thoughts that you have then right that process in your mind all right because jesus knew is is jesus is god jesus he knows he knows anyway right but my point is this i didn't want to deal with divorce today because number one as much as we hate to talk about it there are many divorces in the church and there are many divorces in the church because marriage is not dealt with properly and there are many marriages that are not dealt with properly because singleness is not dealt with properly so if we could get the sequence correct instead of just pretending that we don't have feelings and that we're not human i think we would be in a in a much better place than we are right now all right because again we are supposed to be representatives of god i.e the soldiers of god which means we're supposed to have discipline which is what i wanted to talk about first no don't do god <laughs> which is what i wanted to talk about first before we even touch on divorce because marriage requires discipline to avoid divorce in the first place and single marriage a good marriage requires discipline from single persons sadly as i say none of that is dealt with in the church because we all pretend as if we have no feelings as if we just you know oh i'm waiting for my my boas i'm waiting for my roof and no other worldly woman can entice me which is not the case 99 percent of the time all right so thank you for laying the foundation for me i'm appreciative but i think we need to start with that discipline first before we reach down even to what jesus was trying to say and even behind divorce there's a whole history behind how that divorce sequence would be. because remember it's not two years between the time moses was there and then jesus came it's hundreds of years between them and so they would have had procedures developed um which we have to talk about we have to talk about it so that we would know where they were at and why it is jesus was is is and god is so adamant the uh, anti-divorce all right so let's get back on track with discipline at least for this week and then probably when i think about it a little bit more and pray about it a little bit more we could talk about marriage and divorce and then i'll be able to get some input from everybody seeing as i have no experience in any of it all right so we were talking about discipline and um you're saying that discipline is required so that the goal um is or the main goal is accomplished we know that the main goal of god is to save everybody god does not desire that any one of us should perish he wants all of us to come to it and he wants he wants relationship with all of us right but that requires us to be disciplined examples in front of everybody else and each and every aspect of our lives every and that requires being disciplined requires requires that um we know what god desires of us and how can we know what god desires of us if we continue to study the word of god um not only that if we continue to communicate with him during true prayer if we take time to worship which is different from prayer altogether that's just where you just sometimes just sit and just let god just let god talk to you just let him talk to you worship is just admiring god and letting him just just be near you all right um and so yeah so in order for us to to have that discipline we have to know what god desired of that desires of us and there are things that we have to do that i mentioned before the piece that i was looking at also mentioned the benefits of discipline right so some of the benefits of discipline um uh well at least when it comes to our faith is that it protects us from our self-interest which could be destructive as i was saying before with the example of the military if everybody just decide to do what they want the likelihood that the country would be overexposed is quite high right and it would mean that any and any um force external force will be able to come in and infiltrate so to curb that the military has its rules its regulations and they're very 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 strict with how that goes we know from experience that a lot of us have our own interests 
when it comes to well, I'll say the church, right? When it comes to the body of Christ, we come in with our own notions, first of all, of who God is. We come in with our own, well, long time, they used to, you know, sometimes people used to come to church for like a wife or a husband, in some cases, in some cases. Um, some people used to come to church to pass exams or to get a job, etc., etc. And that's just the stuff that we can mention. Um, sometimes people come and you can't even see it on the face, but they come in with their own agendas. Um, being disciplined and getting to know God and to practicing the disciplines, what I, I mean, it protects us from having our own self-interest outside of the goal of God. It helps us remember, number one, again, who is the star of the show here? Um, who it is about, who is the main character, if you want to play that way. And it helps us get in line with everybody else. Remember, the Bible talks about the body of, well, um, the church being the body of Christ. And it reminds us that the body parts cannot work independently of one another. We all need each other. So if the hand decides it wants to do what it wants, the body will forever be because it basically running on one hand, right? So when we consider that we are part of the body of Christ and that God is the star of the show and we practice our disciplines, then we are able to dump whatever self-interest we have coming in and it allows us to align, realign. The second benefit of discipline um, is that it positions us for God's transformation, right? Because it al when we empty ourselves of everything that we think that needs to happen, our own desires again, God can have a space to do what he needs to do to fill us up, all right? I was like when the, um, the gentleman, the police officer from before last was talking about the bottle of water and, you know, how is it, it was full and whatever. God can't, I mean, he could pour into a full cup, but then it would just flow over to everybody else. And how would that be beneficial to you? But in order for us to receive what God needs to put within us, we have to empty ourselves of something or some things plural. Right, that is a requirement. Um, for some of us, it's pride. Sometimes we feel like we're too big for our brushes, and we forget that is God as at the head. Sometimes it's power. Sometimes we're too consumed with power and being in charge. God is the only one who is supposed to be in charge here. Sometimes we need to empty ourselves of that. Sometimes we need to empty ourselves of fear, which is easier said than done. For some of us, we struggle a lot with it, um, among other things. All right, sometimes it's good things too. Sometimes um, sometimes you have a hobby and it preoccupies your time, but I'll get down to that. I think that kind of overlaps with another point, but sometimes you have a good thing, like a hobby, and it preoccupies so much, too much of your time, so much so that you don't have enough time for God to fill you up. So sometimes you have to empty yourself of that too, right? But ultimately, when we empty ourselves of whatever is stuffing us up, God is able to pour into us his spirit and what he needs from us in order to fulfill the goal, which is to save other people, right? The third thing is that it helps us to stretch our own faith. And coincidentally, we at St. Bernard are going through that kind of situation <laughs> right now, right? Where we can't really see the end goal. Well, let me put it like this. The play didn't make sense. <laughs> the play is still not making sense all this time later. <laughs> But it is, we are plodding along knowing that God is going to work something out. You understand? Um, we can't see it. The tunnel, long and dark. <laughs> like I said, the play did not make sense whatsoever. Even up to today, I was thinking about it. The play doesn't make sense. It never makes sense. Why would you move that pawn <laughs> from there and just leave that space? But um, when we 
when we align ourselves or continue as we continue to align ourselves with god god is going to god is going to work something out right um and that's another benefit of discipline we have i have to say aside all this aside we have stayed the course with the help of god um for the most part and because of the discipline that we have had god is continuing to take us through right so this third point is one that we know is working right um it has stretched our faith it's stretching it a lot almost to the point where i started to see little tear holes <laughs> but um that's one of the other benefits of discipline it allows us to stretch our faith so that we'll be able to walk into any situation and just know that god god has it from the very beginning um and the last thing is that it helps us to fulfill god's mission which is the main point of it anyway of having discipline anyway because again we align with what it is he wants to do um and we are able to just move with his direction now am i saying this is easy obviously not i am struggling with that every day Lynn, you know even just like letting god do what you want right because um sometimes god does some things that you're just like, well, why? <laughs> well, why? But um, at the end of the day, God does everything for our benefit. And so it is in our best interest to make sure that we align with what it is he wants to do. Because the end result, as much as, as much as the hard stuff comes along, always, always over and over, the end result is, all, is always immaculate. Right? I've seen it. I've seen it done a thousand times in my life and people around me it the the end result is always immaculate even though the stuff before it is hard all right so those are some of the benefits of 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 discipline right and obviously it um yeah so let's talk about increasing your faith as well right and just to cap off that part of it before we go back into the actual lesson um some tips for how we can begin to be disciplined start simply but commit right so sometimes some people is here okay be disciplined let me go and fast for 31 days no you cannot just go and fast for 31 days and want to drive fast too you cannot start at fasting for 30 something days or 40 days as jesus did in the wilderness and expect to succeed you have to start small if you know you don't pray every day as you usually do, start praying three times a day. That is all. If you don't pray once a day, start with the once. Right? Start simply and just continue to graduate. Right? Take it step by step. It doesn't matter where your neighbor is at this point in time. Start small. Start with what you know you could do. And as you continue along, God is going to give you like the grace to continue on. The second thing is you can do is find an accountability partner. There is a passage in the scripture that talks about, you know, if one person, um, if one person's by themselves, how can they be warm? But if two together, they could warm each other and stuff like that. And something along those lines, right? Um, a lot of times we feel like this Christian work is a by yourself thing. And so you have to do it by yourself. Um, you don't. And if, if you're not like me <laughs> and you're not an introvert, please reach out for help if it is you need somebody to keep you accountable, to keep you on your toes, to remind you, to pray with you, to talk to you, to whatever it is you need. Right? So that's another way that you could continue to grow in discipline. Third way is to practice something new. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I was very small, of course, parents teach me gentle Jesus, me can I look upon this little child. If I came back, to this day and tell you i still saying gentle jesus me can you would look at me weirdly because it means that i'm not stepping up but even without them telling me i moved on from gentle jesus to our father to there was something in the middle there i know and then to just talking to god huh? what was that? i don't know i can't i don't think it's the lord is my shepherd it might be you know 
Psalm 27. It may have been either Psalm 23 or Psalm 27, but I can't remember for sure, right? But it was step by step by step until eventually, and this is something I'm still practicing, it got to, well, say in my prayers, and then eventually talking to God. And so that's how you have to do it. Practice something new, level up every time, right? Just don't stay on one level. When you feel you can handle something else, do the something else, all right? And it will come naturally to you once it is you're really just invested and you want to go. Do not rush yourself, please. All right. And finally, as we were saying before, let go of something to make room for discipline. So as I was saying, sometimes you have to empty yourself to let God fill you up with something, even though it's a good thing. Um, so that is not necessarily, it's not wrong to have hobbies. It's not wrong to have, you know, extracurricular activities and stuff like that. Just make sure that you leave room to spend time with God. If you find your day too busy, look through your schedule, see where, you know, some time may be taken up that you could like release even if it's at 15 minutes in the first instance of your day just take a few minutes and just like have those little moments with god all right and as i was saying before most importantly the thing that you don't want to do is to guilt trip yourself into growing too quickly all right so inevitably when you try to discipline yourself you're going to hear that little voice saying, you're not doing enough. What are you still doing here? You're not doing enough. Please know that that is the enemy trying to trip you up and continue along the path that God is trying to set for you. I know I don't like to give the enemy credit, but in this instance, yeah, that he. Right? Don't guilt trip yourself. God is not guilting you. First of all, he is seeing your effort and he knows if your effort is genuine in the first place anyway. So... Do, don't get guilt trip yourself into doing anything that you feel you should be doing. Start small, start baby steps. The race is not fully really swift. There is not one prize. It's a crown for everybody who endures until the end. So even if you feel, if you're lying on your, on your deathbed, there should be no time in the future in Jesus' name for anybody on here. If it is you're on the deathbed and you feel like you ain't doing enough, but you know you, what you did, you did as unto God, then that is enough. Don't ever let the enemy convince you that what you're doing is quote unquote not enough. Obviously, if you know you have to pull up your socks, pull up your socks, but never guilt trip yourself into growing. All right? So all of that talk to say this. The whole point of Jesus discussing this part of it with us is so that we could condition ourselves to avoid situations that would require such drastic methods. Um, did Jesus mean it literally? I would like to think not. But I think he went that far just to show us how, f how far we should go from having those thoughts in the first place. All right? That is, that is as wide a birth as we should set between us and some of the behaviors that he described in the passage that we're talking about today. All right. And as I say, um, he wasn't just talking to single people, um, to married people. He's talking to single people too. Because again, discipline is, a, is something that will stick with you no matter what. If you knock or some waking up and brushing your teeth in the morning and you go on some vacation with strangers don't expect i mean the first day she might take you when you see everybody going and brush your teeth and you know you don't do that but inevitably you will forget because you're not accustomed doing that let me use a different example if you know you're not accustomed praying um regularly and you know somebody call you to pray don't expect that words will just automatically come right you're gonna fumble and struggle and you might you might end up trying to pray like somebody else that you remember next door in church which will not sound like you and as a matter of fact it will not be genuine right discipline is something that sticks with you it becomes a habit and it becomes a part of you um and so jesus is trying to get us to 
to get into the habit of not thinking certain things, not doing certain things, not encouraging certain things. All right, by going by that extreme. So what it requires of us as people of God, and I mean everybody, regardless of, of your status, is that we be very considerate of what God requires of us. And we spent a couple of weeks studying throughout this entire chapter from verse 1, come all the way down, of what, you, what Jesus requires of us. So we ain't have to go far. If we need a reminder, just scroll, um, scroll, go, scroll. Just go to, to verse 1 of the chapter and start reading and start practicing. Right? And continue to practice. Right? So, um, as I said, um, this is, this part of it, the overarching thing, even though he talks about divorce and stuff, is discipline. Right? And Jesus did it so well that he talked to single people first and he talked to married slash married people second because that divorce part was really talking to married people. And well, divorce people get the lie up quote unquote all right so for now i want us to think about this part of it and i know we read it all the time and we just take it as if you know well jesus just said jesus was being very serious with this part of the passage he's serious with everything he was saying but he was very serious and it requires a lot more than we actually thinking about all right um and I'll talk away most of the other time, but if anybody has any contributions on this part of it, we will get down to divorce. Because as I said, singlehood, divorce, singlehood, marriage, and divorce is something that is not absolutely not dealt well, well dealt with in the Christian community. I know we like to think that we handle it well, but I could tell you we don't. All right, so while we We'll, we will get down to divorce and marriage and stuff like that, but I want to know if anybody has anything to, to contribute concerning this passage of scripture. All right. Um, I'll just leave it open for a few minutes before we wrap up for this afternoon. So, Kushel, good evening to everyone on the platform. Just a bit on the discipline. Um, and discipline always comes to us as painful but i'm seeing in hebrew hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11 which tells us now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous nevertheless afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby so for at the beginning discipline seems always seem to be painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. And then in Proverbs 12 and verse 1, it tells us, Whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge, but, there, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. So just to add a little that discipline always comes out, comes up as grievous, but in the end, it works well for us. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Discipline is one of the tougher things, as, as much as we like to... It, the, the word is one of our watchwords, and it's still hard for a lot of people to grasp. So absolutely. And by no means is discipline like this walk in the park for everybody, right? There's always something that we are indisciplined in. Right? So it's, it's not easy at all. Anybody else? Right, Sister Kush, on that, on that point of discipline there, um, you well said that um, discipline all, also um, is inclusive of um, growth. And you were saying that if you had continued to see the gentle Jesus and our father, it would not have been showing that you have you are developing yourself, which is a form or which which embodies discipline. And Paul, or well, they say it's Paul wrote it, but 
that is contentious in the book of Hebrews, and um, that is chapter 5, verse 11. And he, he says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to utter, meaning hard to explain, seeing he are dull of hearing, meaning slow of hearing. So according to you, discipline also, if we disallow ourselves to be educated, then that is a, that then that is counted as ill discipline. So Paul is saying, and then you, you know when he go down further, he's saying you should be eating meat and you're drinking milk, you're unskillful, meaning you're not savvy to the word of God. So that is a, a thing we have to teach in the church as well. For people to be disciplined, it doesn't mean sitting down and putting your finger on your lip like we know how we used to do it in school long time. The prefect tell you put, or the teacher tell you put, put your finger, or cross your arm and put your finger on your lip. That is a form of dis that is a form of discipline. But the real discipline is educating, growing, and helping us to understand what is required of us, and it will take the burden off of teachers if we ourselves help ourselves to be disciplined. God bless. Yeah, absolutely, Brother Mike. And it's a good thing that you mentioned Paul because I was supposed to talk about him. I don't have time, but Paul is an excellent example of discipline and even hyper-discipline. I don't know if you realize that Paul... Well, what we have to remember, first of all, is Paul was a Jew. And he so he would have been disciplined from way before. Paul grew up and he yeah he he grew up as this jewish person and he went and you know he was a part of you know all this jewish culture and thing and he was very high up and all he did when jesus found him was he just carried over that discipline into his new life paul was so hyper disciplined um he he was real extreme it was a lot and so um, if you get some time, just go and look at the life of Paul. Paul was overdoing it. If if I ever sat up next to Paul, I would just look like a complete wasteful sinner. <laughs> I Paul was Paul was he overdid it and then some, right? But it was only because he wanted to make sure. And remember, Paul was like persecuting Christians, and he probably was just really truly sorry for what he had done to Christ. And so he wanted to make sure that he didn't hurt Christ ever again. And so that's why he took that line. Um, yeah, but yeah, Paul is an excellent example of discipline. Um, and just one more person before, at least it doesn't leave space for one more person before I hand over to Deacon S. James. All right. Okay. So nobody else, everybody else just kind of like doing like the cow and bringing up and chewing and stuff. So we're going to put a pin in it there for this week. All right. Um, I hope that it was informative. I hope that, you know, God spoke to you as I was talking to you. Um, Cause I know he was talking to me. Didn't like some of the things he was saying, but it is what it is. Right. Um, but please go and, you know, think about it again because when we do go to this next part of it, it's going to take some time to like get through, and we all need to be like prepared to to kind of handle this going forward because this is not just going to be information for now. This is going to be this is going to have to inform us going forward because as we say, the image of the church is not necessarily the best right now, and um even some of the practices are confusing to even the, the the church right practices that we have are confusing the church so we need to get something straight before we could go out and put things straight to other people right so go through this discipline thing because this is going to inform 
our next couple sessions and i hope that you all will um i hope that i was clear all right so god bless you all and have a wonderful rest of the week um over to you deaconess james thank you sister kusha um again um i truly give god thanks for you um that you were able to get into <laughs> these subject areas and subject matters that the church, well, at least by us, but in our circle, let me put it like that, in our circle, um, are not, we are not really dealing with it. Like we, not de we are not dealing, as you said, with singleness. We are not dealing with marriages. And then, whoa, when you reach a divorce, then that's a whole other story. And I think that it is about time we 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 wake up because um this is not something that's happening just in the world but it is happening among people and people are coming to church so i think that we should um seriously think about getting into those those areas and having our people more sensitized about um these subject matters. And I I remember, I keep remembering while you were speaking about discipline and discipline, I keep, because I keep saying it there lately, God, it, that's what he, he wants us to be disciplined. When we look from um, Genesis right down to Revelation, is discipline for his people, you know, for us to be in line. And um, Reverend, our, our pastor, Reverend James, he told us that discipline means a disciple in line. Discipline means a disciple in line. And that is who we are. I never forgot that, a disciple in line. And we are disciples. We are disciples of Christ. And so we ought to be in line. As you said, as you rightly said, God has set his standards and he is not going to ever lower his standards to please any one of us. We have to come up to his standards. We have to get in line. We are the ones to get in line and most importantly, stay in line. Um, let me just, let me just quickly, just that portion that you did there. Let me just, just let me just quickly read this, this, a part of this. It's not all, it has more, but I just want to read a part of it. And this is 27 and 28. It was saying that um, it was saying that um Jesus is not condemning natural interests, natural interest in the opposite sex or even healthy sexual desire. He's not condemning that, but he's but the deliberate and repeated filling of one's mind, mind with fantasies that would be evil if acted upon. That is what he was talking about. And he said that um, some people may think that because the, the writer mean, not that he said, the writer was saying that, you know, if in case you, you if in case the Bible is telling me that if I just think about it, I, I am um I am already committing a sin. Um, so I might as well just go ahead and do it. I might as just, you know, just go ahead and do it. Since seeing that is sin in my mind and I, in my mind and my thought, and I haven't done anything, well, I might as well do it. Then I sit in. But it says that if you do that, if a person think think does something like that, acting acting out these sinful desires is harmful in several ways. And one of the ways it says it, it causes people to excuse sin rather than eliminate it, and that's what we ought to do. To be in line, we have to eliminate it from your mind first. And two, it destroys marriages. It the um it deliberate, it deliberate, it's the it is deliberate rebellion against God's word. And it always hurts someone else in addition to the person who has committed the sin. The person who has committed the sin, yeah, but it will also hurt other people. So it says that sinful, the, the sinful desire 
is still not as dangerous as the sinful action. Because when it is acted out, then you are in some serious problem, problems there. And um, just this, this other part, it, it says there that um, when Jesus said to get rid of your hand or your eye, he was speaking figuratively. He didn't mean literally to pluck out your eye because even a blind person had lost. But if that were the only choice, it would be better to go into heaven with one eye or hand than to go to hell with two. So we sometimes tolerate sin in our lives that if it goes unchecked, it could eventually destroy us. So it is better to experience the pain of removal, getting rid of the bad habit, as you were saying, Sister Kushel, getting rid of some habits, even good ones, or something we treasure, for instance, than to allow the sin to bring judgment and condemnation. So it says, examine your life for anything that causes you to sin and take every necessary action to remove it. It closes right there with just everything you said this evening, Sister Kushal. And I just want to say thank God and thank God for you and for revealing and even for you being able to research these, um, get, you know, get more in-depth um, information and things that you can share with us from time to time. So God continue to bless you. And um, we trust that we would seriously take all the, as you said, read from chapter, from, from um, verse one, from chapter five, and we will see all what um, God, God goes, He's very intentional, intentional in whatever he is saying to us and whatever he wants us to do because we are disciples in line. We ought to be disciplined. So as you say, sometimes it's not, it's not always easy dropping bad habits. And a lot of times we, um, we you know, come down on young people and young people, but well, listen here, even older people, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So all of us have to get ourselves in line to be disciplined. And as we say, we have praying, we have fasting. And as you, you rightly said, we can start simple. You know, sometimes we want to just go and do something great to say that this is what we have done. who will be able to, you know, check yourself with and also practicing something new as um, you, yourself and Brother Mike says that engenders growth. That's where growth comes in. Um, right. And, then, and one of the most important things too is not to carry ourselves on a guilt trip because yeah, but guilt, the enemy loves to loves to take us on on those trips he loves to take us on those trips and we have to be very wise to be able to do like jesus did with peter and say get thee behind me satan sometimes we have to do that because we have to shut out the enemy's mouth and his voice in our minds and our heads so that we will just um empty ourselves as you said and fill ourselves with more of Christ. So God bless you. God bless everyone this evening on this platform and may he evidently keep us in his way and keep us in line. Keep us disciplined. It's hard. It's hard. Sometimes it's difficult, but as Sister Ford mentioned there, the end result is always something good. God never tells us to stop something or don't do something and, and for nothing, you know. He never does that. He always has um, something good at the end of it. You know, as we say, the light at the end of the tunnel, it might be going through the tunnel and it's dark, but you know that eventually if you keep walking, if you keep walking, you, go, you are going to reach, you're going to see light coming in 
you're going to see the light at one point in time. At some point in time, you'll see the light and you'll eventually realize that you're out of the tunnel and now that you, now you are out in the broad daylight, you could breathe in some fresh air and everything, get some oxygen into your lungs now. So we give God praise and thanks this evening. God bless all of you all as we leave this platform this evening. So let me just say the pronounce the benediction. Now may the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us all now and forevermore. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.